Hello, I'm Katrina M. Kraft, and you've just tuned into the Kraft More Cash podcast, where finance meets innovation and strategy becomes reality. With over two decades navigating the twists and turns of accounting, tax, and business strategy, I've had the incredible opportunity to work with startups and Fortune 500 companies alike, crafting pathways for businesses to grow and thrive. I've tailored my expertise to serve the unique needs of industries ranging from real estate to creators to marketing and beyond. I'm on a mission to equip individuals with the financial savvy they need to succeed. Through my Wealth Intelligence course, I'm all about breaking down complex concepts into actionable strategies for business owners. So buckle up and let's dive into the world of financial success, innovative strategies, and the stories that make us all want to keep pushing forward. Welcome to Maximizing Tax Saving Strategies for Small and Medium-Sized Businesses. Thank you for joining. My name is Katrina Kraft. I assist business owners improve their revenue, improve their profitability, have better uh, management of their cash, and we use tax strategies to grow that wealth. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I began working with entrepreneurs and small businesses in 2002. I took that dive into entrepreneurship. And I really am an entrepreneur because I have different businesses. I have a certified public accounting firm. And then I also have Craft Entertainment CFO. It's a management company that helps entertainment industries. And that began in 2016 as well as I am a creator. So I am a course creator. I have a course, a wealth intelligent course and a small business uh, startup course for business owners that are five years or less. And we just really talk about how you can grow your business, maintain your business because 50% of businesses do not survive in the first three years. So we want to stop that statistics and lower that statistics. And that's why the course was created for that purpose. And today we're going to talk about really maximizing the small and medium sized business deductions. Please make sure that you do consult your accountant. Every situation is different. And what I'm talking about today may not apply to you. I first want to ask, are you satisfied with the taxes you pay? And are you confident you're taking advantage of every available break that you can? Are your tax and investment advisors giving you proactive advice for saving on your taxes? That's very important. We want to talk about proactive advice because if you are waiting until tax time, now it's time to prepare your taxes. The decisions that you made last year are going to impact what we're doing on your tax return. And so some of these decisions should have happened last year that I'm going to talk about if you wanted to maximize your taxes on this year's tax return preparation. But it's not too late because we're in 2024. It's almost, you know, very beginning of the year. And there are still different deductions that you'll be able to take. A Supreme Court justice has said there is nothing wrong with the strategy to avoid the payment of taxes. Now, this is coming from a Supreme Court judge. So the Internal Revenue Code doesn't prevent that. So know that it is not wrong to try to maximize and avoid paying your taxes as long as you know the tax law and you're filing the tax code when you're taking those deduct deductions. So the wealthiest know that they need tax professionals, they need uh, lawyers, they need asset pro uh, protection attorneys so that their wealth continues to grow and they can have generational wealth. So this is what we're talking about. I work with some of the richest uh, business owners and work with asset attorneys, work with trust attorneys. And so it's very important that we think about the knowledge that we need in order to protect our assets and also to grow our wealth. So this season, um, in tax season, there are things that you can do. Again, I mentioned that some of the tax deductions 
that we could take, you would have had to put those in place last year. You would have had to pay those last year, but we always have a new day. So 2024 is a new day for us. And we're going to look at different deductions that you can take for this year. And that's a good thing because you'll have the whole year to take those deductions. We're going to go over today in the agenda, often overlooked business deductions, how to save money purchasing fixed assets. We're going to talk about uh, if you're required to, to send a 1099 NEC, that's when you have contractors. So are you required to do that? And what's the due date? And will you receive a 1099? And what does that mean? Or should you receive one? And then we're going to also just briefly touch about the 26000 tax credit per employee that may be available to you. That is a credit that the IRS is giving for business owners who qualify. It could be up to 26000 per employee that you have. So why tax planning? Tax planning really means looking forward. So you want to look forward to minimize your tax, not just recording your history, okay? That's why it's so important to look at what you're doing when you're planning, uh, minimizing your, your taxes. We just really want to make sure that you're looking at that and not just recording history. And that's, that's what we do at the firm. We really look at maximizing, looking forward, so that we can say, this is what we need to do this year in order to get you to the results that you want. So really looking at tax planning is a big part of the strategy. I'm gonna also talk about, can I take this business deduction? Well, the IRS says that you can take a business deduction when it's ordinary and necessary. That's how the IRS defines that. That is a very vague term because you're gonna ask what's ordinary and necessary. Well, ordinary is if it's common and accepted in your trade or business. Necessary means it's helpful and appropriate for your trade or business. So it really depends on the facts and circumstances of your business. What you need to realize is that each industry could have its own ordinary and necessary definition. So it really depends on the facts and circumstances. Let me give you an example. There is a bodybuilder, and that's his business, is to perform at shows. So he may have buffalo meat that he's purchasing, vitamins that he's purchasing, and then he also has tanning oil that he's purchasing. The IRS has allowed him to deduct some of those expenses because they are ordinary and necessary in his business. So the tanning oil he could deduct and some of the special supplements he could deduct. The IRS did not allow him to deduct the buffalo meat. But if I try to deduct any of that, I have no reason to need tanning oil in my business, to need buffalo meat in my business, and to need, and to need supplements in my business. And so that is the difference between really working with a tax professional, a tax strategist that understands your industry because each industry is different. If you are a travel blogger, you traveling and writing articles and sharing with your audience would be deductible. But if someone else is just going and they're taking a vacation, no business related activity with it, those expenses would not be deductible. So again, know someone uh, who's working with you who understands your industry and the type of deductions that are ordinary and necessary. So let's dive deeper into the home office deduction. So the home office deduction, we're going to talk about internet and renting your home to your business. So there is a way that you can get a deduction for renting your home to your business. Your business gets the deduction and you don't have to record any of the income that you receive. So we're going to talk about how do you do that. First, the home office deduction. A lot of people are scared to take the home office deduction because they think it may bring up an audit. Well, maybe what's bringing up audits in these home office deductions are Schedule Cs. And Schedule C is how you report your business if you are a sole proprietor or a disregarded entity. You report it on your individual tax return under the Schedule C. Schedule Cs are audited more than any other business. So sometimes it may make sense, even if you have an LLC. So 
Oh, LLC is recognized at the state level. The LLC is not recognized at the federal level. So the federal level, you have a partnership, you have a sole proprietorship, you have an S corp and you have a C corp. You did not hear LLC, but an LLC can be taxed as any of those entities that are recognized uh, at the RS site level. So make sure that when you form that LLC, that's not necessarily giving you your tax designation. So make sure that you understand that. And maybe if you do an LLC and you're a single member, in the LLC, a single member is how you own the entity. So you're not considered an owner, you're considered a member. If you are a single member, when you set up that entity as an LLC, you're going to default to sole proprietorship. And that means you will file as a Schedule C. If you are an LLC and you have multi members, you're going to default to a partnership. That means that you have to elect how you want to be taxed. If you don't want to be a partnership or if you don't want to be an LLC filing as a sole proprietorship, there is a form that allows you to elect S corporation. You can elect C corporation if you're a single member. Okay. So that's very important because remember, Schedule C's are audited more than any other tax return. We're still going to talk about home office deductions here, and we want to talk about deductions that are allowed. First, if you have a home office, it has to be your principal place of business that's regularly and exclusively, exclusively used for administrative or management activities. No other fixed location is used to perform these activities. So that means you can have a warehouse or an office space or a retail space. And you can still have your home office as long as that home office is used regularly and exclusively for administrative or management activities. So that means you could have the retail place where you're selling, but then when you come home to your home office, that is where you do your administrative tasks, your management tasks, such as it could be accounting, it could be HR, it could be payroll. As long as you're using that space, then you could write off your business location and have a home office. You can also meet customers or clients at your home. So if you do have a business and you meet customers and clients at your home, then you can meet the requirement. You don't have to meet customers or clients at your home as long as you have the regular and exclusive use. Also, if you store inventory or products, so if you have products, and you're storing them in your home, what I recommend is you have an exclusive space just for your inventory or products. Your inventory or products could be books, it could be materials that you, that you have and sell, it could just be your files. Um, so we wanna make sure that if you have that space, it is exclusive. You may have just one closet and that closet is inside of home office, you would take that whole space as your deduction. If you have a storage facility that's outside of your home, like a storage unit, you could take that square footage as well when we're calculating the home office. If you are using storage inventory of products and you're using those in your garage, you're storing them in your garage, what you want to do is make sure you have an area that's just for that inventory of products. So don't mix your, uh, your outside lawn equipment with that area. Make sure that area is just for that space. You could still have other items in the garage, but just for that space, you want just your inventory and products and definitely take a photo of it, um, document that and keep it in your tax records. Because if you ever moved and then the IRS comes back and challenges you, you want to show that you really were storing that inventory in that space. And we also already talked about use a separate structure on your property. So if you do have a storage space, you can also recommend that. Or if you have a se separate structure that is an office, I know that they have the little tiny houses and they also have structures where you can actually build another room. If you have that, 
then also we want to consider that in your home office. So some of the home office deductions that we can take when we're looking at you know, the home office, there's two different ways that you can calculate the home office. It's actual cost method deduction, which allows you to deduct your actual costs, such as home insurance, security systems, utilities, internet, telephone, HOA dues, rent, if you're renting, real estate taxes, mortgages, and many more. So no, you don't have to own the home in order to take the home office deduction. You can also rent. On the actual method, what it's going to look at is the percentage that you have in your home versus the percentage that you're using for your home office. So they're going to figure out, do we take a percentage based on your square footage of each or you can take the home office deduction based on rooms. So you would count, I have 10 rooms and one, 10 rooms in a house and one of the rooms is an office. And so you would have one tenth of deductions of all of these expenses that we talked about in the actual. On the simplified method, it started in 2013. So that's why I, I mentioned that don't be afraid to take the home office as far as you know thinking you're gonna be audited that's not what triggers it. The IRS allowed a simplified method starting in 2013 because they knew that there was a lot of record keeping. You would have to keep, you know, all of your receipts for all the actuals. So they allowed you to use the simplified method. You can deduct $5 for every square footage. So you would need to do square footage method if you use the simplified it's capped at $1,500. So that's the total you can do for the year. So that means that your office space could be up to 300 square feet because 300 square feet times the $5 allowed. It relieves you of having to keep any records. Uh, the negative part of using the simplified method is you cannot carry over expenses. To take the home office deduction, you have to have profit in your business. You have to have a net profit in your business. In the actual method, it allows you to carry over that home office that you deduction that you had, but you couldn't take because you didn't have a profit. But in the simplified method, it doesn't allow you to do that. So when you're considering actual versus simplified, think about, you know, do I have a profit? If not, you may want to do the actual because when you do have a profit, you'll be able to carry those over. Right, internet deductions. Uh, most people are working from homes at some some sort these days. Uh, so inter deduction, internet deductions are something that you're able to deduct as well. It doesn't have to be a percentage of your home office because you're using the internet, you know, totally for your business. So that could be a totally separate expense. So what are deductible expenses for internet? Well, it really depends because we know that if you use the internet, unless you have a separate service just for your business at your house, then you may be using the internet for personal as well. So I really say that you need to maybe keep track of the percentage that you're using for your business. And how do you do that? Just look at the time that you're using it. Um, and then we could allocate a percentage for your company. So you can deduct the deduct the deduction for internet but it really just depends on how you are formed there are different ways to do it in a partnership you record on that schedule c that i talked about in a corporation you get reimbursed just like you're an, because you're an employee you get reimbursed for those expenses in a partnership there's two ways to do it because you have guaranteed payments in a partnership you don't have salary if you're if you're a partner in the partnership you have guaranteed payments and the company, the partnership can reimburse you or you can report it on your 1040 as well. So you really need to work with a tax professional that understands, you know, the Internet deductions. And at our company, uh, we work with business owners in certain industries and typically business owners that have um, over 500,000 in revenue. So 500,000 to 20 million is our sweet spot of who we work with, with the tax strategies. Um, but we do have the small business course and we help you through a lot of, of these deductions and it's a group coaching along with the course. So you get to answer, ask your questions and get answers as well. So internet deductions, we talked about how do you substantiate your home office internet deduction? 
uh, because it can be a problem with the IRS if you're trying to substantiate. So make sure that you're keeping track of how much time you're using on your home internet, as we talked about. And there's also software and apps that will track your internet use. So just Google that and find those apps. Now let's talk about meals. Meals for businesses is now limited to 50% of total expenses. So in 2023, it went back to 50%. In 2018, uh, with the Jobs Act cut, the Jobs Cut Act, it allowed 100% from what we had before. So it was 100%. And when the Jobs Cut Act came into place, it went to 50. But during COVID, there were some special requirements because we wanted to help the IRS wanted to help the economy and especially the uh, restaurants. They allowed for two years, a hundred percent deduction on meals for restaurants. If you ordered out from restaurants or if you ate in at the restaurant, it was a hundred percent. So if you have not done your taxes for 2022 and 2021, know that it was a hundred percent deduction for food. In 2023, it goes back to 50%. So only 50% of total expenses for meals. And those meals are business meals. So they could be with associates, with your employees, with clients. Those are 50%. Also, if you're traveling and you have a meal, it's 50% for you, even if you're not eating with anyone. But office parties remain at 100%. So it's not too late maybe to gather those records if you did have that type of event and um, take that to your tax preparer for deduction. So many employees are struggling to hire and retain employees during the great resignation. It's, that's still happening. It's hard to find employees. So one of the things that you could do is a tax-free fringe benefit, and you can provide those meals to your employees. So they're a deduction to you, but the employer, you know, is the employer, but tax-free to the employee. So that's great. That's a fringe that you could have for your employees. Other tax-free fringes that we talk about when you're talking about, you know, how can I keep employees or recruit employees? Maybe you have health insurance, you do paid vacation. Those are common, um, those are common tax-free benefits as well for employees, along with the meals that we talked about. Uh, the, dedu the deduction for that is scheduled to end in 2026. So this, if this is a perk you want to give to your employees, the time is now. Not only the meals are tax-free fringe, uh, meals qualify for tax-free treatment if they are furnished, okay? So we want to think about that. If they're on the premises, if they're for the convenience of the employee, we're talking about that could be a deduction for you. So think about that incentive for your employees. Also, you have to pass tests. So if the IRS were to question you about this, there are different tests that you need to provide. Is it really for the convenience of the employee or is it the convenience of the employer? Because now employees can really get meals within a reasonable time. When you think about Grubhub and DoorDash and Uber Eats, it makes it harder for the employer to really pass that test because the IRS may say, well, you know, the employee could have ordered in, they could have did um, Grubhub, DoorDash, so it makes it harder. So employees who want to provide tax-free meals, they really need to look at how much time um, is taken for the delivery driver to get there and document if you're far away, like in a rural area, and maybe it's harder to get meals, you want to document that as well. So keeping up with the changes, some of the changes we talked about, we had 2021 to 2022, which was for the COVID convenience. And this is letting us know that post overhaul, this is where we are now. 50% business meals provided by restaurant is deductible instead of the 100. Business travel meals is 50% as well at restaurants. Other business meals, 50%. Uh, entertainment expenses, they are gone. So in 2018, January 2018, with the new Act, Tax Act, it eliminated 
you being able to deduct entertainment expenses. Meals expenses doing entertainment is 50%. So that means if you go to a sporting event game, but then you have food while you're there, then the food is deductible. It's just the ticket to the game is not. But you still have to maintain that you're going with you know, your client, your associate or prospect. So you still can't go by yourself or with your family and deduct it. It still has to meet the requirements for business. Company picnics and holiday parties, 100%. We talked about that. And if you have an event and you're having like an open house and you have food and drink to the public and it's available, it's 100% deduct. Entertainment, we talked about zero deduction for entertainment under the tax Tax Cut Jobs Act, no entertainment. So RS will not allow sporting events, plays, deep fishing concerts, even when the parties attending are all business and it's for business development, it's not allowed. But that's why it's important to know your industry. Let's assume that you are in the entertainment industry and you're going to a concert and you are in the film production or you may be doing something with sound. In that case, it's not entertainment. You're going because you're doing research. You're looking at how things are set up, how's the sound, and you're taking notes and you're providing information that's going to help you in your business grow. Those types of expenses could be a deduction. So depending on your industry, that's why I say it's important. Or say if you're in the sports industry and you go to an event, then maybe those sports tickets could be deductible. Um, so remember, know your industry and who works in that. So for me, I work in the entertainment industry. That's one of the industries that I work with. So I, I know that I work in the real estate industry. So people that are real estate investors um, and from real estate, it could be single family flipper, syndication, um, Long-term holds, Airbnb, that's who I work with. I work with digital entrepreneurs, so creators. And creators could be people that are entertainment creators, digital creators, also work with marketing event creators. So that's the space. I work with medical professionals, so dentists and doctors, uh, people who are in that field. Maybe they have clinics. I work with those psychiatrists anything in the health uh, and medical arena. And then I work with consultants, so independent consultants and coaches um, are pretty much the five main niches that I focus on. So make sure you're working with a specialist in your industry because they should know what's ordinary and necessary. In <music>